Uh, it's my uh, honor to introduce the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Myron Tribus told me years ago, he was one of my coaches and mentors along with Deming and the other people when I started all this. But Myron uh, often told me, he said, to, uh, as you get into this field and you go around the world, uh, the people who are concerned about the quality of what they do are some of the nicest people you ever want to meet. <laughs> and I've never forgotten that over the last 20 years. There's something about when you have a deep concern about improving the quality of society, life, a product, or something, uh, that you have a bigger purpose than just produce something for a profit. Okay? And our next speaker, uh, Tom Rudmick, kind of uh, sums that up for me. I met uh, Tom years ago, uh, starting about 1993. He brought, he brought a team of teachers and educators to um, a conference, started helping him create or do what I could to help with his school. Um, then later he went on to uh, Calgary, Canada, and uh, said, uh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to just create my own school. <laughs> and that way I can implement and do what I need to do. Started helping him uh, create his school in 1997. The, Cal uh, the Master's Academy in Calgary, Canada, has gone on to be one of the very top schools in the province of uh, Alberta, Canada. And uh, Tom has been the leader, the founder, and the uh, champion behind that. But uh, we've, we've gone on to start to say, wow, what can we do to improve society, much like what Ron was talking about earlier? What can we do to take this knowledge to a much higher level? And uh, Tom is one of the few places in the world where you find uh, leaders uh, on a daily basis concerned about who are these students becoming, okay, and what impact are they going to make on the future of society. And that's what's taught at their school. And so it's very profound that we have Tom here today to talk about future-ready students and changing. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, I've got the wireless mic here. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, one thing I noticed right away, th there's a lot of smart people here. You know, the kinds of questions people are asking, you know, you're scratching your head. What in the world are they talking about? I mean, you've got to have all kinds of extra neurons. Is J.W. Wilson here anywhere? Uh, where are you, J.W.? All right, anyways. How many enjoyed that presentation from uh, J.W.? Uh, it's... it's uh, yeah, that's, that's quite amazing uh, stuff that uh, he's doing, and we've been able to connect with JW, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, but obviously, when you sit in sessions like that, you, you have those neurons kind of firing. I think they explode. I don't think they just fire. They just, just, just go off and smoke uh, when you have those powerful sessions like that. Anyways, I'm going to talk about thriving in the world of massive change. There's no question about the world is changing in an in a incredible rate uh, right now. But I want just quickly a little bit about who I am. Uh, thank, uh, David did introduce the fact that uh, I'm an educator uh, and so forth. But first of all, most important for me is that I've been married 37 years. I've got four children. The oldest is 33. The youngest is 21. Three of them are married. And guess what? I've got four grandchildren. Yeah. Anyways, uh, you always start off with that if you have grandkids. Anyways, uh, David mentioned that in 1997. Let me just go back in history before 1997. Uh, in the early 90s, I've been involved prior to that. Actually, I started my teaching career in the late 70s. I've been involved in public education, private education. As far as I'm concerned, both systems are broken. Both systems are basically predicated on a factory assembly line model of education, which fundamentally is not preparing students for the world of massive change. And so back in the early 90s, I began to travel. I began to research, well, who out there is thinking about the future, thinking about education in a different way? And, and so I decided to go to uh, Dr. Willard Daggett's first model school conference in Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, that's where I met this much younger David Langford. And uh, he was doing a presentation on 
quality learning and the Deming principles that he was implementing at Mount Eskimo High School, and immediately it resonated. I said, there is something very powerful that this man has discovered. And a few months later, I attended his four-day conference uh, uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and subsequent to that, uh, we've stayed in contact, and now we've actually built a very, very close relationship. And, uh, and so in 1997, we launched Masters Academy College. I had the privilege of starting the school with the notion that as a school at its core is a research development school. Like how many schools are actually developing and researching future learning models? Well, let me ask you just in a general sense, where anywhere in the world does it happen? You know, when you think of the importance of education to our society, uh, Samsung puts $15 billion into its R&D initiatives. Well, you know, we, we understand that. You've, you've got to stay current with new technologies, right? What about education? Where are the, uh, the models and the schools that are advancing education and, and attempting to uh, prototype new models and all the rest of that? Where is that happening? Now, I'm sure there's places uh, that you can point to and universities will have certain things going on. And, but it was in my heart at that time to say, let's start a school at its core is to look to the future and design and create models of education that fundamentally prepares students uh, for that world of tomorrow and not of yesterday. And so in 97, we founded it, and since then, we've been award-winning, internationally recognized school for what we've been able to accomplish. Uh, sure, a few years later, uh, I started a software company, my older brother Andy. Uh, he is a PhD computer science guy, again, another smart guy. And so uh, we started this uh, software company and have uh, been developing kind of uh, technologies around education and, and how can we fundamentally support and change the ultimate performance of education, not just efficiency, not just to deliver content online. We're talking performance improvement, effectiveness, not just efficiencies. And so uh, we started to do that and more recently uh, when we've reconnected with David Langford and and uh, some other people have come on board. We have launched Profound Learning Institute, which is a specific educational focus within that company that we've launched, and uh, with the tagline, release, releasing joint brilliance. Now, okay, I'm gonna give you a little quiz here. Uh, very smart people, so I'm kind of uh, interested to see how you respond to this very simple little question. All I ask you to do is just answer by raising your hand, all right? Which of the following numbers is least like the others? It's not a trick question. Maybe another way of asking which one is the most different, okay? So it's not a trick question. Which of those numbers is least like the others? I'd like you to raise your hand when I call out a number. How many would say 31? Raise your hand. All right, handful. 13. One third. All right, there are some other possible answers, but let's just take a look at first what happened in your, uh, in your mind. The first thing that you did when I asked the question is automatically your brain put a box around these numbers, the, the 31, 13, and 1 third. The numbers 1, 2, and 3 uh, are, are kind of in your brain. Is th these are listing numbers. Okay, Those numbers, based on the pattern of thinking that you have, only connote order. So they're not significant. The pattern we have in our mental models is that only what comes after the order setting numbers is relevant. You know, when Deming has 14 points, point one, it's not the one that we look at, it's what comes after the one, right? Well, that's what you were trained. You've been trained to do that. But if you were to look at all six numbers, not the three that I called out at the end, and I asked the same question, arguably, as somebody called out, the, not, the answer could be arguably the number two, which is the only even number on the page. The question I want to ask, why did you not see that? Why did you not even think about it? Well, the, the answer is pretty obvious, is that you have such a conditioning already. You have a predisposition towards understanding the nomenclature and, and how all that works. And that points out how our mind works. It's a pattern-producing mechanism. We do not interpret what the world is telling us, we, we, no, we do interpret it, but it's through the patterns 
We don't have just raw data coming into our minds. It's all being processed through mental models, through patterns of thinking that we have about the world. Uh, J.W. Wilson mentioned uh, yesterday about the, uh, the chess pieces, and uh, there was an experiment done where 20 chess pieces were shown, uh, shown for five seconds. Uh, the experts were able to guess, or sorry, remember correctly 81% of the time. And novices, only 3% or 33 or one-third of the time. And so, obviously, what's at play here is the chess expert had a a patterning, and so when they looked at the board, instantly they were able to assemble that quickly to fit the patterns that already existed, whereas the novices could not do that. But the experiment went on, and this is the interesting part, is that when those pieces were placed randomly on the chessboard, the experts did worse than the novices. So that which helped them to be the expert in the first scenario where it all fit the rules, when the rules were broken, they were not able to do as well. And that is the challenge we face when we take a look at anything like education. When the rules get broken, we have a hard time seeing how that's going to work. Anyways, uh, take a look at this uh, little video here. Uh, could, could you imagine taking out your credit card, scraping your windows down, all that? Just imagine the next guy coming out, looking at his car, I'll scrape down. Here, here's what I, there's a couple of things about that clip. First of all, I showed this clip this past July in, in Nigeria. I was speaking at a conference with a bunch of Nigerian uh, educators, and I showed that clip. The response was complete opposite to yours. They just sat there. They looked at it. No laughter, nothing. I explained it to him. I said, the, the, the guy, he scraped the wrong car. The, and the reason they couldn't get it is that their meeting network did not have ice or snow in it. They were trying to figure out what in the world, what is this Mars or what world is this? What's, what's happening here? Because nothing in their meeting network connected to the concept that a car has ice and snow on it. And they sat there, and after I explained it, they all laughed. And I don't know if they laughed just to be polite to me, but nonetheless, they laughed. And so that was a very interesting little uh, experiment. There's a lot of activity going on in education. A lot of people trying to, quote, fix the problem. The question is, are we trying to fix the right problem? Or are we just scraping down a car and finding out, hey, we just did the wrong thing here. And arguably, one can look at some of the past American issues. I can speak to it. I'm Canadian, so please don't get offended. But I look at some of your past uh, federal initiatives. I hardly think that it made a big difference. I'll speak to that later. In a world of massive change, let's just take a look at what this world is like. Uh, here's a few uh, things that are happening. There's so much that is going on. but. Uh, take a look at this one clip. This represents the world's first single atom transistor made with absolutely perfect precision. It's the work of researchers at Australia's University of New South Wales and it demonstrates all the potential for being the building block of a super fast quantum computer a device that will solve some of our grandest technological challenges. The thing that's unique about the work that we've done is that we have, with atomic precision, positioned this individual atom within our device. Single atom devices aren't new, 
but the ones developed so far have a margin of error of around 10 nanometers. A tiny spatial shift, but enough to affect their overall functionality. So this individual position is really important if you want to use it as a future quantum bit or qubit, uh, because it turns out that if you want to have control, precise control at this level, uh, you need to position the individual atoms with atomic precision with respect to control gates and electrodes. And so several groups have tried this and indeed they've been able to isolate a single atom in their device. But really, if you want to make a practical computer in the long term, you need to be able to put lots of individual atoms in. And there you find that the separation between the atoms is quite critical, so you need to have atomic precision to do that. And so that you can also bring electrodes in to address each of those individual atoms. So this is kind of the key step, making that first individual atom device, but in a, a, a technique that would allow you to scale it up to put lots of single atom devices in towards making essentially a, a full-scale computer in the long term. The beauty of the UNSW device is that it's encased in silicon, a thoroughly researched material commonly used by industry. It opens up the possibilities for future manufacturing. Anybody that deals with uh, silicon quantum computation would be hard pressed to go past Australian publications at this moment. So with Michelle's group over the last years or last five years I'd say definitely has established itself as a world leader in that field. It's predicted that transistors will need to reach the single atom level by 2020 to keep pace with Moore's law. A trend that sees the number of transistors squeezed onto a circuit double every 18 months to two years. So we really decided 10 years ago to start this program to try and make single atom devices you know as fast as we could and try and beat that law. So here we are, I guess, what, 2012, and we've made a single atom transistor roughly about, you know, eight to ten years ahead of where industry is going to be. All right. I'm not sure if that volume was loud enough for you to hear, but the essence of this uh, breakthrough discovery just recently is that now we can have uh, a transistor uh, which basically is what these chips are, a bunch of millions of transistors, uh, at a single atom level. It's unbelievable that now the smallest possible component size of a transistor is, is going to be reached. And they predict that the speed of the computers that will be running these quantum bits will be in thousands and millions of times faster I heard one person say a billion times faster, but I'm just not sure about that, than what we currently have. We have fairly good computers. We, we've got fairly fast technology. In the next few years, it's going to be blown away. What we've got today is a mere shadow of what is to come in terms of computing uh, speed and capabilities. Well, we also understand the connectedness of the world. There's 5.8 billion mobile uh, telephone uh, our, our subscription users, uh, by 2017, they expect the internet connectivity to increase 3,000-fold, with 92% of it being uh, uh, having mobile coverage. Today's the internet uh, availability to 93% of the world's population. And they ex are predicting that by 2020, there will be 50 billion connected devices. It's unbelievable what's coming down the pipe. Uh, as I was in Africa just this past summer, there is a massive project that's going on that's running these high-speed uh, fiber optic lines all the way around the continent of Africa that's bringing high-speed connectivity to Africa. And, uh, you know, I, I'm no expert in this field, but uh, I understand, and I've seen this happen in China and other, way, other places, that they can leapfrog in technologies ahead of us simply because they don't have aging infrastructures to deal with, and they could put in the newer infrastructure. And that's what happens in many of these third world countries. Uh, I'm not sure if you get Wired Magazine, this month's uh, cover magazine. It says, this machine will change the world. 3D printing. Very exciting technologies. What's interesting about this 3D technology by uh, uh, MakerBot is that it's affordable. You could buy it for $2,500 and have it sitting in your home. That's amazing. And it's only going to get cheaper. Here are some things that you can create with this uh, MakerBot uh, stuff. But now, variety is free. It costs no more to make every product different than to make them the same. 
Complexity is free. A minutely detailed product with many fiddly little components can be 3D printed as cheaply as a plain block of plastic. And flexibility is free. Changing a product after production has started, has started means just, changing the, uh, but just by changing the instruction code. You know, here's some examples, some very complex uh, things that can be designed and, and movable gears that work within each other, all printed in 3D. It's amazing. Well, I heard this, I read this, I'm not sure if it's ever going to happen, but somebody was predicting that eventually we're going to have 3D printing of organs. You need a new kidney, they will, that there will be a way for you to print a new kidney. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but that's where the science is going. That's where the thinking is going. Uh, the ENCODE project, we all under, have heard about the Human Genome Project. Take a look at the ENCODE project. Right, big breakthrough in genetics today. I'm going to explain what the Encyclopedia for DNA Elements, the ENCODE project, means for human genetics with the help of my trusty ping pong balls, some string, a bit of tape, a few paper clips, and some cherry tomatoes. Right, here we have a section of human DNA, the human genome. The blacked out ping pong balls are bits of DNA that we uh, previously didn't know what they did. And the red bits here by tomatoes are genes. Now, a decade ago, the Human Genome Project gave us a complete list of the three billion letters that make up the human genetic code. And people said at the time that we had the book of life. Now, it turned out it was harder to read than we expected. When we looked at all these genes and all the DNA, scientists found only 20,000 genes, and that makes up about 2 to 3 percent of all our DNA. The question became, what does the rest of this DNA do? In this model, the black balls. It was mysterious. People didn't know what it was. They actually called it the genomic dark matter, the dark matter of the genome, or worse still, junk DNA. For a while, scientists weren't sure if it did anything at all. Thanks to the ENCO project, we now know what most of our DNA does. These newly revealed regions, the white uh, ping pong balls, these uh, are sections of DNA um, highlighted by the ENCODE project, their role is to control what happens with our genes. And in this analogy, I'm using the cherry tomatoes. So the majority of our DNA is not making proteins to build our cells and such like. What it's actually doing is controlling how these genes work. That might mean they're acting as switches to turn them off and turn them on, and where and when in the body that happens. Or they may act like volume controls, turning a gene up, turning a gene down a little bit. So what use is all of this? Well, first off, it will help scientists understand how our genes operate in our bodies. These switches are incredibly crucial to what genes are doing in our bodies, and they will make the difference, for example, between how our body makes a liver cell as opposed to a kidney cell. Perhaps more importantly, the ENCO project will help understand what goes wrong in scores of diseases where there's some genetic element. Now, scientists have already used the ENCODE data to identify 400 of these switches in the genome which feed through into diseases and other medical problems. And that is surely just the beginning of it. So it's called the ENCODE, which is the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. And it's going to be pretty exciting once we can get to understand that these, there's so many, like 20,000 genes, and all of these regulatory systems are going to be in this encyclopedia. Now, I want you to remember this, because I'm going to come back to something at the very end that will relate to this. Now, let's go to thriving in the world of massive change. I've given you a few examples of some profound things that are happening in our world today. Well, a lot of people are wondering, Hey, forget about thriving. I just want to survive, you know. And, uh, you know, Stephen Hawkins said that this century will be the century of complexity. And if we understand a little bit about this uh, notion of complexity, what we're seeing here is that as the rate of change goes up and, and, and complexity is increasing with that rate of change, our ability to manage complexity is decrecing over time. And where it's getting more and more difficult 
to, to deal with the changes that are taking place. And so as most people are looking at this world of massive change, most people are simply surviving. And the way one survives is by, as quickly as possible, adapting to the changes around you. If you understand complex adaptive systems, the very nature of, of living systems is the ability to adapt to the changes or else life would not exist. All right? And so adaptive, complex adaptive systems do that by nature. But that's not thriving. That's only surviving. Well, here's an example. Uh, IBM did a survey around the world of CEOs, and 65% of them planned radical change in the next two years, and 61% feared that changes from a competitor could radically change their business landscape. Now, that pretty well nails what the climate of change is out there in the marketplace today. So if one takes on the approach of adaptation, you know, I, I've got to be as nimble as I can to adjust to whatever change comes my way, guess what? You're always playing catch up. Is there another way? Well, I believe that there is. I'm not going to deny the importance of adaptation because, quite frankly, you need to have that ability, not only as organization but as individuals. We have introduced the concept in our school, this notion of future by design and not by default. And the basic premise of that statement is that the future is going to come your way. There's nobody here that's going to stop it from happening. The question is, are you going to engage with that future by intentional design, or are you going to receive it by default? Well, I'm going to explore that with you right now. Well, as we take a look at the same graph here, and uh, we look at the rate of change, and uh, if we simply take on the continuous improvement uh, of models, chances are we're going to be left behind. And so many companies like Toyota and others have adopted not only continuous improvement, but also continuous innovation. That we must continually be on an innovative curve if we're to be uh, uh, relevant in this world of massive change. We take for granted the speed of innovation. In many ways, it's because we live in a little wee bubble. And so many of these changes actually don't impact us directly, at least at, at, at any single moment of time. And so we, we are not always conscious. But the next 15 years, we'll see an acceleration of innovation and change and disruption on a scale that no civilization has ever experienced before. Well, continuous innovation. Let's th think about that for a moment here. All right, so why Germany still makes things is the question that I want to pose. Uh, over the last, uh, you know, Germany, as we know, is a very highly paid workforce. Uh, they, their workers are paid at least 10 times more than a Chinese worker. Yet over the last four years, as we have seen decline in manufacturing, as we have seen jobs being shipped over to the Asian markets, the exports in Germany have not changed. They have more or less maintained the abilities to manufacture and to export their products. And the question is why? Well, it's because they have been able to embrace the notion that it's the innovation ability that will enable them to thrive and not just survive. It's their ability to connect the science and research and universities directly to manufacturers like BMW and Mercedes. And they're working on common problems as, as the researchers and universities are, work, are helping to design new processes, new uh, methodologies uh, and, uh, that will enable the German companies to maintain a lead. Uh, BMW, for instance, has been uh, working on composite manufacturing technologies. And today, they're the leader in the world. And they've got such proprietary uh, processes and, and, and technologies that it's almost impossible. I, w I shouldn't say that, but it's, it's very difficult for a competitor to, uh, to catch up with them. And so here's an example of uh, some of their innovation.
Germany today is one of the leaders in material science research and development. <laughs> well, you know what? We got a, a giant out there. It's called China. Well, China is not just sleeping and just kind of ignoring what's happening in the world today. They also are looking at the need to have an innovative, creative workforce. And over the last 15 years, some significant advancements in how they're uh, advancing their uh, universities and research capabilities and the number of patents that are being produced. So China's not ignoring this. We can't just think, well, you know, the, you know once we can get our act together here in North America, then we're going to kick butt around the world. No. Everybody gets this message. And we've just got to be on top of our game. I've got to say, though, America is still tops in ingenuity, still tops in innovation studies in the world. But I'll tell you, the rest of the world's catching up real quick. Well, if we take a look at some uh, surveys that have done, CEOs, uh, 500 CEOs responded on this one particular survey. Uh, what must one do to survive the 21st century? And the number one answer was practice creativity and innovation. Yet, when surveyed further, 6% of them felt their organization was doing a great job of it. In other words, it's one of those classic examples of a great buzzword. You have a general idea. It's like years ago well, about quality, until you understood that quality actually had a theory and philosophy and practices and processes. You know, like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we want all quality, right? Well, how do you get it? You know, and today, yeah, we all want innovation, of course. You know, we understand that innovative organizations will lead, right? So it's something you notionally accept. The question is, how do you practice it? How do you create an innovative organization? How do you create an organization that is actually thriving by creating new services and products? This creativity deficit may be the single most dangerous gap in business today. Well, I'm going to get a little personal with you. Back in 1999, I was flying from London to Nairobi. I was involved in an uh, education conference in uh, Uganda, and I had one of those epiphany moments. Ever have those? You know, you're kind of sitting there, and all of a sudden, you just get a download. All right, well, that's what it was. And uh, it wasn't a particular book or anything that I was reading, but uh, it just came. And uh, I wrote this down on a piece of paper. And the, this is very primitive, and it's matured in many different ways. But this IQ model came to me. This notion that there are four bas basic zones or identities we as human beings can uh, live in or uh, inhabit, if you wish. Uh, there is the manager identity. There is the technician identity, the innovator, and the inventor. And, and as I parse it out a little further, you know, the manager role or researcher really is about maintaining the status quo. It's about researching what's already known. Uh, it's maintaining balance. And by the way, all of these roles or identities are needful. This is not a hierarchy that says, well, if you're not the I3, then you're nobody. No, if you're an I3 all the time, chances are you're going to self-destruct. All right, there's a balance. You need to understand how to be a good manager, a maintainer of, of, of what needs to be maintained. And then the second identity is the technician, the I to the one, uh, which is the improvement uh, uh, perspective, improving what already exists. And, and then if you go in the upper two quadrants, the green and the red zone in my model here, is the innovator and the inventor, where you're pushing the boundaries of the box in the, in the far one on the left, on the left there, is where you're actually saying, what can I create that's not even a box? The inventor goes outside. It starts to imagine things that aren't even uh, necessarily uh, reasonable at, at any given point of time. Well, as I began to think about these identities, it became very clear to me that within the context of education, what kinds of students do we graduate? If these four identities or roles truly do exist, then what do we focus in on when it comes to education? And I would contend that for most people, at least, uh, in the K-12 environment, at least, uh, it's the I to the zero, the researcher, the engineer, uh, very little on the I to the one, uh, two and the I three, the designer, visionary, entrepreneur identities. And then I came up with five keys, the five keys to unlock what I call the I cube life. 
You know, if, if, if we have this ability to be creators and designers, and I believe that we have that ability, it's fundamentally what separates us from the animal world. I don't know how many dogs that you own that have built dog houses, but I have yet to see one in my life. I have not seen a chimpanzee design a laptop, but I have seen people do that. And so we have a unique propensity or endowment that enables us to be creators, to be designers, to be thinking in, in ways in which uh, I don't see elsewhere. And in terms of uh, these five keys, uh, you know, the first one that we teach our students is to find the big why. What, what's the cause that I attach my life to? It really deals with my identity and understanding who I am. And, and there's a whole whack of stuff that goes in there. Understanding what activates drive. And we've come up with seven breakthrough drivers that drives people to do extraordinary things. And what drives, perhaps, Bill Gates is not the same that drove Albert Einstein. And so we've come up with seven different things that drive people to do extraordinary things. And we teach this to our students and for them to discover who they are. Uh, we teach them how to have sight, seeing the invisible, which means that you, ha you have to understand what is. System thinking is very important and understanding how things are working, why they work today, and having foresight to understand what is about to happen. As a matter of fact, we teach our kids that not only can you see the future, you can enter the future, and you can also learn from the future. Think of that. You can actually go into the future and learn. Well, you go there with your imaginations. I haven't yet invented a machine, so uh, please don't think I've got that. All right? Well, and then you make the invisible visible through the process of design. Design, innovation, creativity is a process. It's not one of those things you either have it or you don't. It is a process. Creativity is a discipline that everyone can manifest. Uh, we teach students the 22 habits of creative people, understanding what kinds of things should I actually put into my life that enables me to be more creative. These are things that we can learn. And then, finally, there is the build, where you actually go and actualize what you're envisioning in life. And so we've come up with the IQ organization. You know, what kind of organization does this kind of stuff? And most people thinking about schools, well, surely, do they do that? Well, we do. We, we took several years to try to understand the emotional dynamics within an organization to be in a place of change. And I won't go into detail. It's a very interesting story uh, in working with educators, walking through the process. And, uh, and so we began to ask this question, how then do we prepare students for that world of massive change? After all, we're, we're a school, you know? And uh, so we came up with this model that we call the profound learning model or the I-cubed model. It kind of looks like this. After 15 years of development uh, at Master's Academy and College, let me uh, just start very simply. Back when I met David Langford, uh, it became very obvious that there was a very powerful model or system that, that was deploying the Deming principles of how we can create, a, 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 call it the knowledge workers, the students, and how do we create autonomy with them, how they could own their learning, be masters of their learning, and, uh, and, and how to increase the joy and drive out fear, and all of those basic tenets are so powerful, and they work. And uh, thanks to David, who pioneered all of that stuff, uh, we've been recipients of that, and uh, we've been deploying that in our school. And our students engage in system improvement as engineers, as a role, which is the I-1 identity. Well, the second layer of this cake, if you wish, uh, is mastery. And uh, I went too fast here. Let me just go back. All right, there we go. Uh, you know, this is not a new model. The problem-based learning, many of you in engineering will probably have problem-based, inquiry-based learning as a, a part of the way you are being taught. Uh, this, mo this inquiry-based model, which leads to mastery, is layered on top of student autonomy or quality learning. Students are now researchers. It, it leads to mastery by making quality rigid and the time to learn flexible. That in itself is profound. 
When you think of the assembly line, that is not the assembly line. The assembly line is the opposite. Quality is flexible and time is rigid. All right? And just by deploying that simple principle years ago at, at our school, and I'll show you in a moment what kinds of results we've gotten. Students are meeting exceeding quality benchmarks all the time. And then the, the, the third layer of this cake, if you wish, and pardon me, this is going a little, there we go. Design-based learning is kind of, it's that unique model that we've developed at Masters, that, and it all fits together. You know, you can't just kind of take one separate from the other. They all deal with different kinds of tension that needs to be resolved. The quality learning tension is dealing with system tension, where you need to improve something. The, uh, the inquiry base uh, uh, is all about cognitive tension. You've got to resolve a problem. It's a cognitive issue that you've, you're dealing with. Design-based learning takes the students into a new place. It enters the student into a world of creative tension. They're not the same tension, and hence the process of designing these experiences are different, yet they're incredibly powerful. And so design-based learning is established on the base of autonomy and mastery. The student becomes designers of the future. They're creating new knowledge. A deep sense of purpose is achieved as students design the future of their world. They have ownership. It's in their meaning network. It's their world that they're designing the future of. Students become practitioners of design thinking in the creative process. And I want to show you an example of this. We did a, uh, a, a mass project a few years ago. We did one on Journey to Mars 2028. And, and the students were fifth graders to ninth graders. All right, so that's what, 10 to 14 years old. Okay, that was the age of these students. A mass project meaning there's 200 students involved, 16 teachers over a period of five months. So it's not like a little project where you put up a little bifold and say, you know, every kid stands up and says, no, this was complex. 200 kids with all that stuff going on. And uh, so I'm going to show you the video clip of, uh, of the end product. I'm not going to show you, I don't have all of the stuff that I, I typically would show, but at the end of the expo, there was also a process room where we had photos and processes to show the parents what was the process of learning to create what they, they just saw in the, uh, in the two gymnasiums at our school. And let me set the stage. You know, you as a parent uh, or, or a student, you, you, you've been given arrival time. You arrive into the space cafe. Uh, the space cafe, you're uh, welcomed into there on a specific time frame that you're supposed to arrive. Um, and in the space cafe is going on, a fashion show, all kinds of stuff is going on. And then you have to uh, go up the space elevator to grab the shuttle, which takes you to Mars, which was our big high school gymnasium. And then they enter into Mars, and then they're there, and that was their journey to Mars. So that was the experience for the parents. Take a look. Mars Exposition and we are trying to go into the future and give everyone like all the parents and students a peek into the future. This room is the technically the elevator where people are waiting to get onto the shuttle to go to Mars. Agriculture showed us what type of plants would be able to grow on Mars. The other people in, say, food de designed all the food and created it. We're incorporating like a whole bunch of elements like music and fashion and everything like that. That's what it's going to look like in 2028. And you're off to Mars.
this whole uh, gym is what it's going to be like on Mars. So all the politics, all the structures. We're a travel agency and we made a whole bunch of advertisements. We're putting up a display for Mars Venturio, which is technically um, a travel agency that kind of makes adventures to um, blow away stress from moving to another planet in Mars. Um, and if there's a dust storm, you just kind of pull it around you and it lasts. This one is called the Animaris Rolius, and it rolls over the softer terrain. And this one's a different species, and it's the Animaris Hoppius, and it hops over the rougher After terrain. After the journey to Mars, you may be like sick or something, you go in here, and it scans your body, see if your like, blood sugar is so low. So basically, it's a train, people would go inside the ball, which is the ping pong ball, and they, it'd shoot them off to where they needed to go. Math, we incorporate like buildings. We have to like make sure they're right dimensions. So you learn about the planets in the solar system. For science, I'm in the structures group, so we had to design a house that would be sustainable on Mars. All about how people are gonna learn how to get oxygen, how people are gonna learn how to get power on Mars. I've learned so much about electricity since I've came here. We're always learning. We're always moving forward in our studying, and so it's very, it's very believable that it might people come in here and might actually think that it's going to happen in 2020. I am just blown away by the creativity and the, uh, and, and you know, the maturity of the students. Facts that they put together, like it makes it seem like it's very real and even possible. That the children have worked together um, on a mass project. So yeah, it's impressive. It's, it's good to see. It's uh, so much imagination here, um, so much thought, so much research and uh, a lot of effort. Just stunned by the quality of the work that the kids have done, the effort that they put into their projects, and the variety of projects that all seem so age appropriate. It's amazing the depth and the interest that the kids themselves have had in these projects. Thank you. You know, design-based learning, you don't get to be a designer by reading it in a book or hearing somebody lecture on it any more than you become a golfer by reading a book on golf or watching a video on golf. You've got to put the club in your hand. You've got to go out in the driving range. You've got to try to whack the ball. And for our students to become designers of the future, we have to create experiences for them to begin to hone their abilities and skills of being designers or being engineers or being researchers or inventors or entrepreneurs, which are part of what we call the 12 uh, essentials of being future ready. Uh, we are now in the middle of prototyping a new program for our high school called the ID School. It's not a separate school. It's an actual program within a high school. And uh, we've recognized that there's so much rhetoric about we need to have schools more innovative, yet you go to any state or provincial curriculum, and same in the province of Alberta, there, it's nowhere. Nowhere does it t tell you, or is there a curriculum or some kind of process around how are we going to engage our students to become more uh, understanding the design innovative uh, process and what they are, and how do we create those experiences. So we are building that uh, as we speak. And uh, we're building a whole curriculum around uh, students and their identity and who they are as, as creators and, and designers. Uh, the integration of human knowledge across multiple disciplines, because we understand that designer is not a singular, it's not fashion designer. You gotta, you gotta design new business models. You gotta design new technologies, new everything. You know, uh, the world of design is, is talking, looking at design thinking and then having the kids design uh, design of the world, being engaged in real design experiences. And here's a glimpse of our...
this room that they're in, back in 2004, we decided that if we're going to have students learning and experiencing design-based learning, you need to have a physical environment that is more conducive to that kind of experience. And so back in 2004, we decided to go into the future and take a piece of our future into the now. In other words, we could not afford to build a new building, but we we're able to build an innovation center and that's where our kids now can go and explore and, and work in a different way because the pattern language of that room calls for a different behavior. And so that's what we've done. And now this past summer, we've expanded that to take off, take up an entire second floor of our high school. And we're in the midst of expanding and building a, a whole new addition. But we've had eight years of experiencing the future in that space. It's been wonderful. Anyways, I've got to move this along because... Uh, I'm kind of getting behind schedule here, at least on where I'm at. Uh, anyways, uh, you know, when we take a look at future-ready skills, there's all kinds of core skills that go in there, and uh, integration of JW's learning code is into there. Uh, listen to uh, JW here. What is the value of getting good grades? You know, the answer isn't what we think it is. We tend to believe that good grades immediately transform into life success, into being somebody adding a tremendous amount of value in the, in the world. And one of the easiest places to look is towards valedictorians. Karen Arnold at Boston College did some seminal research. Really, I think she started almost 20 or more years ago, or 30 years ago. And what she did is she followed valedictorians. She has over 11,000 pages of research on this. And she followed valedictorians to see how well they performed in the world. And what she found was an interesting thing, that these valedictorians, who everybody thought were going to rule the world, in general, what happened, about 70% did pretty well in life. In other words, they were good accountants, they were good lawyers, they were good doctors. But really, and I think it's a, I'm very close to her quote, these were not the people that tended to change the world. They were people that tended to fit the world. So it's really interesting. These people, to be valedictorian, had to work so hard to fit a system. What they learned how to do was what? Fit a system, not transform a system. So when they came out, as the brain gets older, it gets less plastic. And we can always change it, but it still is less plastic. But imagine that you've had 18 years of being successful, mainly because you had an overabundance of neurons in the right part of your brain, and you fit the system you were in. But everybody thought you were a genius. The truth is, as I said before, we're all geniuses. We're just not geniuses and fit the, the traditional educational system. We saw them as geniuses. We treated them as that. And we basically you know, kissed their behinds because we loved them so much because they fit so well. Unfortunately for them, when they go out in the world, they have to find they use the same strategy out in the world that they used in the educational system. So they fit, but they don't really excel. Now, there are some excellers. It's a bell curve. But in general, the most of the valedictorians are in the middle where they're doing OK, but they're not adding tons of value. And about 30% aren't doing so OK. So, but there's, there's this, uh, the other end of the bell curve where you think you'd see high, it shouldn't be about where you, you think you'd see high levels of people succeeding greatly. They're just not there, the research shows. And other research shows that their levels of depression, anxiety, and worthlessness can be higher. Why? because they can never succeed as greatly as they did when they were in the educational system as when they got out of it. I'll just cut it off there. Recognizing that point, and when you think of how schools are measured and uh, how they're ranked, it's on academic scores, right? The studies have shown that, that those are not necessarily the measures that will translate to success in life. Now, I believe in high academic abilities. I'm not a proponent that says, let's, let's toss out academic excellence. Actually, we have been able to demonstrate that we can get high performance and high academic results as well as develop individuals into who they are becoming. We've often said that uh, you know, who, it's not what you get when you go to our school. It's who you become. Now, you're going to get a great quality education because we've got the test scores and the, the ranking to show that. And quite frankly, we think it's bogus anyways. But who you become 
is really what's important. Now, the credibility we have for saying that is because we are one of the top-ranked schools, so we can say that. Well, we've got these 12 essential skills. I'm going to hurry this up here. You know, developing uh, our students in those uh, various identities uh, that I've mentioned to you, and there's 12 essentials that go with that, and I won't go into any detail outside of the fact that these are intentional identities. Starting in kindergarten, you're going to see the seven habits of the master learner. They start as apprentices. By the time they hit grade six, they should be a master learner, hence a teacher. I loved one of the first things that struck me when I met David uh, years ago. He said, students are colleagues in the learning process. How many have heard David say that? Well, when are they at the status of a teacher? When actually are they grown, matured? And our system, we can actually develop and track that. And uh, we've got the only system that I'm aware of that actually tracks student development in non-academic or in the effective domain of students. And, that, and the reason for that is we believe it is as important or even more important than their academics. Well, I'm going to shift gear here and try to move quicker. Uh, you know, the people have talked about the educational system. James Canton, a, a futurist, said the education system is broken and must be reinvented to prepare nation's products and services that will build the creative economy. Uh, here's Otto Sharma wrote the theory of you, and he'd basically say I, higher education uh, really is not developing the innate capacity to sense and shape the future of, uh, of this world. Uh, here's your president. The future is ours to win. But to get there, we can't just stand still. Robert Kennedy told us the future is not a gift. It is an achievement. Sustaining the American dream has never been about standing pat. It has required each generation to sacrifice and struggle to meet the demands of a new age. And now it's our turn. We know what it takes to compete for the jobs and industries of our time. We need to out-innovate, out-educate, and out-build the rest of the world. Let me ask you, why is it not happening? I mean, we understand that, you know, that's a good thing to say. And it's not just your president, by the way. Uh, we've got documents from the Ministry of Education in Alberta that talks about the vision for, uh, you know, Education 2025 in Alberta. It talks about innovation, invention. And my question is, where is the curriculum? Where is the process? How are we equipping our teachers to understand the processes of what it means? And so there's a lot of rhetoric around it. It's just not happening. By the way, that hole upstairs has been blown out and opened up. Education open. needs massive change, uh, massive transformation. People have asked me, what is the real problem with education? And I've answered by saying nothing if you're living in the 1950s. The system is doing exactly what it was designed to do, which is to develop students that will conform and comply and, and meet industrial age standards. The existing assembly line approach to education exists because it's the only way we knew how to manage large groups of students back in the early 1900s. The world has changed and we need a totally new system of education. No amount of tweaking the industrial age assembly line system will produce the kind of results that are needed in this 21st century that we live in today. Most reform attempts, such as No Child Left Behind, have focused on treating the symptoms of the system and not the real problem. The problem can only be understood when you have a vision 
for a brand new system. For 25 years, we've been developing and field testing profound learning in thousands of schools. And over the years, a new model of education has emerged where the vast majority of students can attain academic excellence. Imagine a system that is far more cost effective, where the brilliance of every child is unleashed. Where teacher stress is reduced as students gain greater autonomy over their learning. And ultimately, a system that produces responsible and resilient and confident students that are prepared with future ready skills that are essential for the world of tomorrow. So what's the real problem with education? Everyone has an opinion of what the problem is, so I'm going to ask, what's the real problem? And for me to frame this, I actually have a definition of what a problem is, and you'll see in a moment. So if you have a different definition of a problem, well, that's fine. We'll just, you know, we'll just have a different definition, that's all. But in understanding, you know, we understand systems. There's input and output. You know, the current system has a various outputs. If you want to improve the system, you apply some kind of improvement uh, methodology, and the system improves, and, and on goes life. And uh, the, the challenge we have is that the current system was designed in the industrial age for conforming compliance, meeting standards. That's all it was designed for. And, uh, you know, that was the, the hallmark of what was needed. But now we got an age where knowledge is doubling every 18 months. What kind of school system do we need to have that not only accommodates that kind of transformation, but all the stuff that I talked about earlier? And so when we start to think of it, if the system itself is obsolete, all right, and you start to tinker with it, and, I, uh, and you're tweaking it, and, and you, know, you start blaming. I hear all kinds of blame. But, you know, I'm saddened when I hear you know, people blaming teachers. I will say there's more bad politicians than there are bad teachers on a percentage basis, all right? It's, we don't have a teacher problem. We don't have a union problem. You know, it's not a pay prefer, for performance problem. The system itself is what produces the variation. It's the problem. And so no real change happens if you are simply tweaking the old system and expecting it somehow miraculously to turn around and be a super uh, steroid system. And, and quite frankly, even if you got higher academic results, the question still is, are you preparing kids for the world of tomorrow instead of the world of, tomorrow, of yesterday? And, and most likely the answer to that is no. Anyways, when we take a look at this obsolete system, and how do I define the problem? This is uh, from the M.G. Taylor world of defining a problem is first it starts with a deep dissatisfaction of the current system and you, you have a compelling vision for something different. And when you can see that difference, the problem is all about how do I close the gap between the there and the here. The problem is about system transformation. And when you understand the problem is what do I need to create? What do I generate today that will bring me closer to what I envision over there. It stops the blame game. All of a sudden, we put our heads together as a group of educators and, and community members and parents, and, and we start to think about how do we progress towards that vision that we have. And uh, we talked about uh, a little bit yesterday, uh, JW talked about that there is no behavioral change without a biological or neurological change. And I'll just add one other piece to it, is that you don't get a system change until you get a neurological change first, then a system structural change, and then you have a behavioral change from a system's point of view. We have to re-educate our faculty, our teachers. We have to re-educate our parents. Uh, we have to build new structures that will drive different behaviors uh, of all the stakeholders. And then we have to do the same uh, with students and so forth. And we can go through transforming education. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit on that video, you saw it, the, you know, what we envision, a personalized, individualized system of education. Increase of joy, engagement, flexible time, and reduced stress, and increase of brilliance. Uh, students are truly future-ready skills. 
And as I said a, mo a moments ago, it's all about system transformation. So the question is, if one can actually have a vision for something new, then what are those new structures that we have to build? Well, that's what we've been working on. It's not just rhetoric. It's not just, you know, communicate and hope that somebody somewhere wakes up one morning and there's a new system. It's done through sheer hard work and a lot of guts and courage and pain, too. Anyways, uh, we have developed what we call the profound learning uh, ecosystem. And uh, it starts with customization. And uh, a couple years ago, I decided to redo my office. And I wanted the office to be much more dynamic and collaborative in nature. And so I went to a custom furniture manufacturer in town in Calgary. And here's a short little video clip of them talking about customization in, his, in their industry. And this is a part of a larger video that we're producing right now. So we are uh, pushing very hard at SEMO to be uh, a major entity in, in at least North America, hopefully worldwide, with uh, products that are focused on um, spaces in offices and uh, uh, for folks to be able to collaborate and to concentrate. Our clients come to us in many different ways. Sometimes it'll be a napkin sketch. Uh, they will uh, be in their space and they'll envision what would optimize uh, their space for them. And it can be a napkin sketch. Or many times they'll hire a designer or architectural firm who will do more formalized drawings and be able to articulate what they want. So I would say that at SEMO, maybe 50% of our product comes out of a catalog. The other 50% is either tailored where they'll take that product and we'll do what's called parametric technology. So our systems from front to back are geared towards being able to do quantity one. So we don't care if it's 100 pieces going through or one piece, we're able to take that product and stretch it and all the math comes with it. So whether it's the fitments, the hinges, those types of things. So it doesn't impact our lead time or cost for our clients and they're able to get individual uh, solutions for their space based on our process that we've uh, put into place from front to back. The technology has really enabled us to do this at a far greater scale than we were ever able to before. So for instance, when our raw materials come in the back door, we have large sheet goods that come in, for instance, in 5 by 10 sizes. Uh, we use what's called optimization software, so when we start cutting pieces that are individual to those clients, we may cut six clients' products out of one sheet because they will optimize the use of those materials. So before, maybe waste factor would have been 10 or 12 percent on raw materials. Now it's less than three or four percent because we use optimization software. So technology has definitely made that a lot easier. Even equipment manufacturers realize that stamping out the same size product continually isn't the way to go anymore. Mass customization is the new um, uh, term that's used in manufacturing a quantity of one so that you can tailor that product and have it go through. Next week, I'm going back to SEMO uh, and we're going to shoot some more footage where basically we're going to start talking about, is this possible for education? If we can do that, if there's that level of brilliance to produce a chair or a table or a whole office system, surely we can put some of that brilliance to work and to develop these systems for schools where we can customize the learning to the individual. And I'm not talking about computer-based learning where everybody just sits behind a computer all day. I'm not talking about that at all. I believe in, in human interactions with teachers and students with students. So it's not some kind of a sterile sitting in a classroom in behind a computer all day. No, we want rich learning experiences. But what kinds of systems can we develop that will enable that, those students to be freed from that fixed time and quality being flexible model? And uh, so we are designing out solutions. And it starts with a learning orchestration system that we've designed as a software web-based uh, system uh, that we've developed at uh, the company called Genius. Uh, and Profound Learning Institute is the educational division, if you wish, of our software company. Uh, but in this orchestration, it's not a learning management system. It's a learning orchestration. We have the abilities to map out the entire state curriculum. Uh, we have capacity maps, and those that understand the Langford quality methodologies will understand that there is ways now to take that 
that curriculum and, and, and represent it in a capacity map that the students can, or the teacher can design powerful learning experiences to the map. And then the students can reflect on their learning at the higher orders of cognition. And, uh, and so all of those tools and, and teacher design tools and helping teachers design these uh, experiences and having a teacher da dashboard that allows them to track what's going on in, in, in their classroom, assessment engines, and we have a patented knowledge retention that allows us to transfer essential knowledge 90 plus percent. Well, there's some of the uh, Windows uh, uh, screenshots up there. I'll just move on. We have the profound learning model, which is part of the overall system. Again, I'm not going to go into detail. I already explained that. Uh, we've got a whole system that we're under development. And how do we track who I'm becoming? If this is important, I, I don't know if Deming said this or somebody else, but you know, what you measure is what's really important, right? If you, if you can't measure it, well, that's not true either, because how do you measure love, right? Uh, all right. But the point is, if the development of the student into somebody who is going to be a thriver is important. Should we not have systems in place that allow us to do it? And this is not an easy challenge, trust me. This is not a, a true or false. You know, this is a lot of self-reflection, and it's very interesting to watch how some of the younger kids do it, and, and how do we develop and mature these skills, and we're working on developing these systems as we speak. And then we're do, uh, putting together a whole teacher professional uh, association because we recognize that without training the faculty, uh, the chances of adoption is going to be very, very slim. So we've got a whole association and a teacher development program and systems in place that we're designing and building out as well. There's going to be a learning exchange so that, you know, that journey to Mars, what a great experience. Well, we could take that experience using the methodologies of our system, it can be encapsulated into, I'll use the quote, app. You know, we all understand the app stores. And in the learning experience exchange, you literally drop it in there, and a teacher can choo choose to share it or even sell it. And now it becomes something that can be become shareable with teachers, and they could drop it into their student uh, calendars, and all of a sudden it populates across the board for all of the kids. And so it's an opportunity for learning experiences to be developed and shared uh, amongst many, many teachers around the world. And uh, we've got one of the finest uh, brain researchers working for us, uh, uh, J.W. Wilson, integrating the learning code virtually into everything that we're doing. Uh, we've got these patents around uh, knowledge transfer. I won't go into detail, but we've closed the leaky bucket syndrome. I'll just say it that much. Uh, you know, we've got all kinds of op uh, ways in offering seminars, uh, transformation processes. Again, if we are looking at transformation, okay, not just incremental improvement, but transformation, the question you must ask, what's the process? And we've got some powerful processes where we take large groups of people, because in complexity and the requisite variety principle from cybernetics basically says to deal with high complexity, we got to bring a large number of people or high complexity to attack it. And so it's not like five or six people sitting in a room. We could take 40, 50, even more people addressing the complexity of the problem of the district and going through a transformational design process. And those are things that we have. And uh, as far as master's is concerned, I mean, uh, it's a great school uh, as, in terms of a laboratory for us. So, you know, we, we have a technology branch to uh, who we are, but how many have actual schools where you can go and Im implement and and this is uh, who we are. But here's what's happened in the last 15 years. We've been able to prove categorically, and I've had arguments with superintendents of school districts that have argued that the normal curve is a represented, represents the abilities of children. Because they've got 50 years of norm reference uh, testing to prove that that result works, or that result is, is there consistently. And we've just, by changing how we cluster kids, uh, how they learn, uh, we don't screen for entrance in our school. We're a public school. We have open admission policy. Uh, we started as a private school. We're now pu a public school. We are now 300%. Uh, we're approaching 70% of excellence, which is exemplary. There's two standards. There's an acceptable standard, which, and then there's excellence. I don't know, America, what you've got. Uh, the acceptable is the, well, I'll answer questions in a moment. I'm sorry? 
Yeah. All right, there you go. And so there it is. So we are, we've proven that we can change the performance uh, or the, uh, by changing the system itself. And, uh, you know, the rankings in the province out of 1,000 schools were in the top five. Well, here's what's happening. This is a model around the stages of the enterprise. And it talks about, uh, you know, you, you go through the early stage. You know, the, the, the greatest innovation phase in an organization is in its early stage. That's why big companies buy little companies, all right? Because they're very innovative. They've got nothing to lose. So they're going to go for the gusto, right? Well, guess what? After 15 years, we've got a reputation and we've gained success. We've, we've hit that curve of success and we're starting to get to maturity, all right? And what happens is the innovation goes out the window and now we've got something to lose, okay? We've got a reputation. We've, we've done so well. Well, why risk that? Why not just kind of coast along? Well, a year ago, uh, we engaged our faculty with what is called the e-button, the entrepreneurial button. And in this uh, e-button moment, we said in the next three years, we're fundamentally going to engage in the innovation cycle one more time in a deeper sense than we've ever done before. And we're going up another cycle of, or, or, or a slope of innovation here. And, uh, and it's really a rebirth moment that organizations go through. And I'm showing that because I think every school district can do that. You can press an E button. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody, wholesale uh, changes are happening. No, you could start with a pilot school here or whatever it is. How you go about uh, transforming your, your district is uh, really contingent on you and your, your people, but you can press the E button. And uh, we're going through all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, I, I'm just going to speed up here because I'm basically out of time. Uh, you know, Daniel Pink, how many have read him? Yeah, Drive. Uh, you know, he talks about level three, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Uh, you know, that's, that's where he thinks good organizations. We've discovered a higher level, OS4, operating system four for an organization, which trumps those three. And when you put in vision, when you put in a compelling picture of the future and you ask people to be a part of that, I'll tell you, that trumps everything. People are, have a sense of calling to be a part of that. And, uh, you know, Steve Jobs says, we're here to uh, put a dent in the universe. Otherwise, why else be here? You know, that's so true. If you get that mentality happening in your organization, uh, look out what will happen. Uh, I'll skip through here, and I've got a comment landing here. Uh, so the question is, okay, Tom, and, and I'll show you in a moment our team. Oh, that's a pretty audacious dream. You know, you, you actually want to transform education around the world. Well... We, we truly believe that it can be done. And we got an incredible team of leaders that have, uh, are working with us and are part of our team and uh, some of these folks uh, you've already met here at the conference. So can it be done? All right, well, if we just remember in the last year, year or two, who would have thought that we, you'd see a toppling of governments just through friendly you know, uh, demonstrations and the implementation of social media? All right, what it shows is the power of networks. And, and when you can get a network going, uh, watch out where, where that whole thing can land. And so in terms of looking at our change processes, and, and I was in Nigeria, and one of the first questions the educator asked me was, all right, Tom, how do we go about changing education in Nigeria when the people at the top really don't get it? Well, maybe that's the same question you have here. You know, may, maybe the people at the top here don't get it. And, and so what I, my response was, let me challenge the assumptions of that question. The assumption is that you cannot do anything unless somebody at the top is aligned to what you want to do. I think that you don't actually have to have that uh, uh, alignment or agreement. You can create uh, what is called a shadow system. And that shadow system, let me just go back here for a moment. The shadow system fundamentally can be a bunch of schools that are networking together saying, you know what, we have a common purpose, common vision, where we're going. Uh, there are schools in Australia, schools in Iowa, schools in Ohio and Canada, and we're just going to join together in a shadow system that's going to be positive, constructive. We're not uh, uh, throwing hand grenades at people. We're not blaming. We're not labeling. We're just doing something that's going to fundamentally change our schools. And what happens through Metcalfe's law is you get the critical mass, you get enough of those schools going, 
to the point where now you have what is called a tipping point, and the rest is history. And, um, and that will lead to system transformation. I made a comment uh, a Friday night to a select few people that tonight I want, or I'm going to share something that I think will rock the world, and this is what it is. Uh, you may think I'm crazy, but at the beginning, I showed you a clip on the ENCODE project where they're the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. What we are wanting to do, maybe hopefully in the next two years we can launch this, uh, is we want to map all of the major countries in the world's curriculum. And we want to map that to a global curriculum. We want to be able to create the encyclopedia of global learning. And in so doing, we will be able to have teacher exchanges and teacher sharing of these experiences back and forth because it's all mapping into the global journey map that we want to build. It is on, it's not quite the same magnitude as the ENCODE DNA project, but it is significant. Because when you start to think of the ramifications of how this could lift education, particularly in, in countries where they're quite limited in, in where they're at, we can lift the, the uh, educational uh, nature or the, the, uh, uh, the opportunity. We can lift it around the world, and that is our vision. Now, I, I'm saying that on the heels of what Steve Jobs said. We're here to make a dent in the universe. The thing about us is we're actually foolish enough to believe that we can do it. And I hope you can see and believe that you can do and change your world as well. And we are putting out a, uh, an opportunity for uh, collaborative partnerships. So there might be districts that want to partner with us. We have a program that we want to work with some early adopters. Uh, uh, you know, some of our system is already completed. Uh, and some is quite mature, and others are in, is in development. So we are looking for schools, even organizations that we could partner with uh, in, a, in a collaborative sense in building out these solutions that really, really work for you. Basically, I'm done. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me this time. <laughs>